Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to Shadow Empire, a game that I did do a video on previously, but it has now received its first piece of official expansion DLC, so this is really a video on Shadow Empire Oceania, which introduces new generatable planets to the game, which is a mechanic we'll have a peek at in a little bit, near the end of the video probably, where you can now generate planets with quite a lot of oceans on them. They also introduce a new mechanic, the Maritime Trade Houses. Uh, there are no naval units in the game yet, mind you. The developer says that he is planning to introduce some form of naval system, but he didn't want them to simply just be counters on the water, so he's currently considering how exactly to do naval formations and units in the game whilst not making the maritime houses completely pointless. So the maritime trading houses are essentially um, bands of flotsam scavengers, etc., that live in big old fleets on the water. And you can contact them to do a wide variety of deals. You can invest in them to get shares that will pay out dividends. You can contact them to supply your troops, to move your troops, to invade across watered bodies, etc., etc., etc. And of course, you can also pick your favourite maritime trading house and try to make sure that they win the war against the other trading houses, so to screw over your enemies. For example, the guy who's currently in charge of this area here is the blow Blowfish... Uh, yeah, just Blowfish. Uh, they're my friends. Whereas the people who had it before, deep water, were not my friends. Which allowed my enemy, over here on this island, to continuously naval invade me. Now they cannot naval invade me through this area, so they've got to go all the way around here, which is why their current beachhead is down here, in Tisa, which is a very, very long way. Now, sadly, there are no real, like, naval logistic lines, so I feel as if it's a little bit of a half formed system really but you know it, it's cool enough and i'm waiting for actual naval units to you know be fully informed on that but the base game itself is interesting enough to be worthy of a little bit of conversation so i am planning a war against my neighbor here bernillo now bernillo is a fairly peaceful regime with not a major area but they do have one very cool thing you see down here they've got a city can't see it right now, but I've had spies in their territory, and they have a piece of ancient technology, a cloning generator, which I want. Badly. And I am more than willing to kill all of them to get it. The story of the game, by the way, is that you are a regime on a planet somewhere in the galaxy. Back in the day, there was a whole galactic empire, you see. I believe, um... Where was it here? There is a, a planet? Ah, yes, here we go. So, there used to be an entire intergalactic empire. But then, shit hit the fan hard. The empire collapsed hard, and you got sent all the way back to de facto the Stone Age. And now that you've finally figured out how to begin to reassert your dominance over the planet, you are going to be one of several dozen other scattered little major and minor regimes trying to take control over the world, fighting over relatively limited resources since you don't have the technology to gain the infinite resources, at the very least not yet, whilst rediscovering all of the technology you have lost. You can also generate uh, planets with quite a bit of detail, including stuff like light forms, uh, sentient life forms, the composition of the atmosphere, etc. Uh, right now, this planet is a little bit of a Pandora style planet. Lots of forests, lots of water, but the air is straight up poisonous. No, in fact, it's not just poisonous, it's nerve agent. If you are exposed to the air at all in any way, not even breathing it, just touches your skin. You're dead within seconds, which is why all of my units are equipped with environmental suits to keep that from happening. And most of my buildings are dome buildings as well. Although the local fauna is edible, so I can also create... I believe I have an asset of that here somewhere. 
You can create agricultural domes to create earth crops, uh, but you can also actually eat the native fauna on this planet. At least to a degree. Uh, I can't actually find one of the xenoform farms here, but trust me, I've got them somewhere where I'm growing xeno crops. In fact, I could just go to the construction thing, couldn't I? Uh, there you go. The Xeno Agricultural Facility, where you grow the native flora of the planet and then eat it. Across the map, there are also going to be various special hexes that give you special things, like the refugee camps giving 200 population, the geyser turbine giving power, and various stations that you can also construct, or things you can find that gives you, again, bonuses. The game has quite a few resources, food, water, oil, munitions, metal, uh, production, energy, radioactives, and then you've got your soldiers, your recruits, your colonists, your rare metals, your machines, and your high-tech parts. Machine and high-tech parts are very rare to begin with. Eventually, you will be able to produce both, as I am currently doing, as I've got a heavy industry producing machines, and I've got a high-tech industry producing a tiny, tiny bit of high-tech parts, because this thing eats energy like nobody's business. And I haven't really managed to figure out, um, you know, nuclear technology and such on nonsense yet to really boost up my regime's energy manufacturing capabilities. As you can see, I have expanded across a fair bit of the map right here, and I am waging a running low-intensity war against these invaders. I managed to cut them off so their logistical situation is going to be ass, so I am eventually going to be able to deal with these. In fact, we're going to end the turn in not too long, and uh, we're going to try. But I do have some interesting things over here, too. So you can see, I have a few remnants of Xenos creatures here, because there are sentient alien races on this planet. I have been able to in integrate one of their territories into my nation, giving me access to a bunch of their units. Now, these units can be pretty damn good, honestly, early game, but at this point, yeah, they're pretty shit. And by and large, these guys are just keeping a bunch of um, ocean monsters away from me. Because, yeah, the ocean includes various monsters as well, and the monsters will come up and numb you. This is one of the complaints I have, by the way. The alien creatures in the game act far too much like an organized military force. In fact, at one point, I had one of my army divisions cut off because the alien animals figured out how the logistical supply system worked and were cutting them off by severing the road connections. Even in combat, they use the logic of regular military formations. For example, I had one time one of my iron mines occupied by two meter tall space turtles. When I tried to get them out of there, I noticed that the two meter tall space turtles had entrenched themselves. I, I, I don't know how they managed, but yeah, they they apparently built fortifications to keep me out. So, good job, space turtles, I suppose. Ah, the game also has a card system where you generate stratagems every turn, uh, depending upon how much money or uh, bureaucratic power, more correctly, that you're putting into the various um, leadership roles as you have a group of organizations. If you haven't got that yet, this is a very goddamn complex game, by the way. So everything, or most things, are done via these stratagems. For example... I've got a couple of major regimes over here that I've just started bordering because I took over a large swoy, sw swathe, 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 English, of alien territory, which is why I've got a bunch of alien mercenaries over here, which I'm going to try and figure out what to do with. I've got some Xenos territory over here as well, and I've got an unclear relationship with the Xenos. So what I could do is go into strategy, stratagems, and miners, and I could start playing cards on that territory, like sending Xeno diplomats or diplomatic teams, for example, to begin starting communications, because I'm going to have to learn their language first and foremost, and then begin actually negotiating with them diplomatically, or I could simply invade them. Now, considering the fact that I'm a bit busy with a war up here, and I'm about to be busy with a war over here, Invading them might not be the best idea, but I do have an assload of new alien mercenaries. 
More immediately worrying is the fact that I also have a major regime here in Wurmraum, another non-aligned force here, another major regime here, and another major regime here. So I've suddenly got a lot of neighbors. Now, this one is a friendly major power. This one is not. It's currently blackmailing me, and this one is actively hostile. Now, luckily, this one's on the other side of the water, so I don't need to worry about it just yet. But I do need to try and get into contact with these guys. So let's get up the stratagems here and select Majors and Open Contact. I've got three cards. Playing a card costs six um, diplomatic power, as you can see up here or political points, PP, and they're executed by D. Ethel here, who is my Chancellor of Foreign Affairs. Now you can see, when I select Wurmraum, the difficulty is 201, because they don't like my ass and they frankly had no interest in communicating. So I get a D100 plus 117 for her skill, so highly unlikely, okay? What about Dupontstaria? Okay, they're definitely open to a conversation. In fact, this one's pretty certain, so let's execute that strategy. And we did it. Okay, so we will be able to talk to them. Lovely. Let's also set up relations with these guys here, the Karaginis Republic. And that one is easy because they're friendly. There we are. And I can only play one of these on them each turn. So now I establish communication, and eventually I can build amb ambis amb ambises embassies, and I can eventually form entire alliances like I have with Zeldan Hansa down here. We have a military pact for victory, which is why they're also invading my enemy over on that piece of shit continent all the way over here. Thank you very much, friends. All right, for the aliens, um, since I can talk to these guys, I'm going to assume I can deal with them. So let's begin... Just, oh, poking and prodding a little bit. Okay, well, we've discovered some defenders, and as they are in a defended position, they just beat that shit out of me. Yep, more of them over there. The, uh, the Xenos militia are uh, getting a uh, bit beaten up already. Hmm. All right. Oh, Jesus. Okay, they've got a lot of dudes here. The Xenos, I will say this too. Uh, one thing that annoys me is the artificial change in the power of the Xenos. When you're fighting them, oh, they're dangerous as all hell. When you get them on your side, <laughs> not quite so much. Not quite so much indeed. All right. Well, I do have my regular defenders over here holding the line. Uh, if there's going to be this many, I'm going to need regular army forces as the Xenos are not going to be able to pull this off, as the Xenos also have larger formations than me as well. This means I'm also going to need to set up logistical lines, so this is going to have to wait until later. Right. With that out of the way, we are going to pass a turn. I am just about ready to start my offensive here. Uh, let's see the fountain. Oh, you're actually lacking a launcher there. Let's get you reinforced nice and quick. There we are. And I've got a wide variety of units that we're going to go over in a turn. So let's build up a little bit more munitions. We're going to order the production of another 2,000 munitions. And we are going to end the turn. Ending the turn does take a uh, wee old bit. You can actually um, instruct the AI to take less time so that it turns cycles faster, but in turn the AI makes, well, dumber mistakes. Dope. I've turned it on to not do that because even late game like this, the turns, they take a little bit of a while, but they don't take that long, so I'm not overly bothered. And you can see the steps that the enemy is taking here. Now, of course, if you can't see what the enemy is doing, you can't see what the enemy is doing. But as you can see here, I do have some intelligence on the border area so I can see their moves. And I can also rewind this later to see the moves precisely in case you don't notice because it's going by kind of fast. All right. We suffered no losses nor made any kills. We are currently in a crisis of passion. So these are eras. Uh, as the game continues, we'll enter into various eras that will have various effects. These can be beneficial, or in this case, kind of ass, in that it is currently increasing unrest in my entire nation, which sucks a lot of dick. As you can see in uh, Archtopia here, uh, I've got no unrest because it's garrisoned. Over here, we've got a little bit of unrest. Over here, we've got a little bit of unrest, and so on. 
So you kind of got to worry about that a little bit. You will also generate a series of decisions each and every turn, which is your advisors and your boards um, doing things, usually stupid things that scurry over, and also reacting to events in the world. So managers want own mess hall. The project leaders at Military Research Council are unhappy they have to take their lunch in the same mess hall as the common bureaucrats. According to them, it prevents them from discussing sensitive information and is hurtful to bringing a sense of proper hierarchy to the Military Research Council. You can see I have three decisions. Arrange for separate mess halls, tell the managers to stop this elitism, or give them the best table in the current mess hall. And you can see, your commanders will react to this very differently, as each and every commander has their own stat blocks, their own preferences, their own abilities, their own personalities, etc, etc. And you gotta keep them happy, because if you don't, well, they'll start stealing your money, and sabotaging you, and leaving your service, and just being generally shit towards you, so... Mm. It also affects your larger empire. So, for example, this one would give plus 14 points to enforcements, which is basically a descriptor of how um, your society functions. Whereas this one would give 15 to, I think this is heart or something. And this one would give it minus one to each. So, this one is clearly the best one from the, you know, people liking it perspective. But I really don't want to boost my heart statistic. So these statistics are also bound up to the uh, profile here. So the further you go on a certain profile, the more special abilities you will eventually begin to unlock, which unlock special cards that uh, give special abilities or even special units. Now, right now I've gone fairly deep into the mind one. I wouldn't mind giving up the universal truth, because Robertian and Siege, like Siege is actually pretty good because it doubles your artillery attack. And Heart would instead take me down this path right here. So, for this one, we're just going to give them the best table in the current mess hall. People don't like it, but I want to screw over my statistics right now. Protest against high income tax, okay. Uh, we could calm them down, but that's a D100 plus 62 versus difficulty 123. Eh, we'll just ignore it. We can eat the unrest, no problem. A CEO, okay. There is also a mechanic where your cities can have corporations. These corporations, you can tax them to get money out of them. They will also add money to the private economy. Yeah, that's another thing as well. If I click on the zone assets, you can see these are the assets I have. They are national assets. Whereas these brown ones are private are assets or personal um, private economy. Private economy assets are not run by your workers. They are run by the population. The more of them you have, the happier people are, as they give quality of life bonuses. They also contribute to the private economy. So if I click on the minor city here, on the people, you will see that there is a lot of money. Private funds are huge here. People have ass loads of food, they're just hoarding it in fact. Um, they've got a lot of money saved up, and they're really pretty goddamn happy, frankly. This in turn excuse me, also turns into a good service tax, an income tax, and a sales tax. As your uh, citizens will consume services, uh, they will have an income, of course, and they will also purchase things producing a sales tax. So a vibrant private economy is very, very beneficial, as they will also build useful buildings like farms, for example. They can also build on-map upgrades like metal mines or oil pumps as well, and to in turn that in turn into the private economy. So in this case, the CEO has an emergency. Helping the corporation will give me, um, well, it cost me only five PP, so I will give her the PP. Everyone likes the corporation, because they're greedy bastards. The Maritime Trading House is offering to buy some industrial production. I have more than enough of it, and I'm happy to do that. Our spies in Brunillo have found information. Okay, I don't really care about that, so that's whatever. Okay, that's the decisions. Now, as we're planning for an invasion of Bernillo, we're going to lay the groundwork with some covert ops. We're going to target it, and we are just going to start sending in an absolute assload of spies. And I don't really care if he fails in sending these in. I just need to fill that nation with spies. He's got a, he's got a very good chance, actually, so I'm not too worried. 
We are just going to fill it to the absolute goddamn gills with spies. There we go. So they are going to give me a lot of information, both on the internals, but also eventually next turn on unit movement. And they're going to start removing fog of war as well, which will be super useful for actually, you know, killing the little bastards. But before we get to the warfare part, there are yet further mechanics we need to consider. Oh yes, again, like I mentioned, complicated game, which is why I love it. So, you've of course got a wide variety of units as well. I can raise the formation. And you can see, these are all of the formations I can currently raise that I've researched. And many of these also have variations. For example, tactical bombers. I've got spotters, tribbles, apaches, air snakes, moonrise, and apache twos. These are reference, referencing, referencing, referring, English, Jesus, to various types of units I have modeled over the course of the campaign, which you can find here. So, for example... My basic rifleman started out with a simple slug thrower and an environment suit. The next guy in the line, Rifleman 2, has an automatic rifle and a padded environment suit. The next guy, Gore's rifle and combat armor. And my current top line infantry, laser rifle and heavy combat armor. Each one of these models must actually be modeled out by your research council. So we've got the organization and the model design council here. Currently, they are working on researching a new automated turret, for example. This system, which I can show you here, is done by picking the chassis. So you can see I've researched quite a lot. To begin with, you're going to have uh, MG, truck, buggy, and like infantry. Simple as that. And maybe bike, I think. And then you begin unlocking more of these. Let's say, for example, that I wanted the... This is actually very new, the mobile shield generator. So I would actually... I don't think that's a good... Um, no, an aircraft is good where I should stop. The medium aircraft, right? So we start by selecting whether we want a brand new design or build upon an existing one. Let's build upon the Starfire. All right. So we can make it a fighter, recon, fighter bomber, tackle bomber, transport, level bomber. So we're going to make this a fighter bomber. Okay. Then we need to select the engine amongst all of these as well. So a nice heavy turbojet engine. Uh, wingspan. Wingspan mostly is dependent upon if you're on planets with really dense atmospheres, for example. So we're just going to go with tiny here. And we're going to keep it a nice big fuel tank of 8,000. Uh, Air-to-air -air weapons, we'll give it a twin heavy machine gun to give it something. And ground weapons, we're going to give it heavy rockets and no cargo space. So that will generate a aircraft with a range of 20 hexes. Minimum takeoff speed, 236 km per hour. Maximum ground speed, 565. So it can actually take off. If these don't match up, it can't take off and it'll be an invalid design. Maximum air speed and maximum range. So you can do all of this for all of the various units, which is really, really goddamn cool. We're not going to have any new orders for now, though. You've also got the various research councils, which will give you access to uh, new technology like buildings or new units or new weapons or new upgrades and also so-called linear tech. Uh, linear tech is simply upgrading tech that you already have like um, creating better aerodynamic aircraft, for example, or a personal armor optimization, which is what Applied Science Council is working on right now. Now, I am going to call him, and I am going to take his research here, and I'm going to set him over on... What else we got here? Fuel efficiency. You can have research a fair bit of that. Launcher, payload prospecting i wouldn't mind prospecting right now but i think i'm going to take payload because i'd love it for my aircraft to deliver a little bit more of a punch you also have larger formation so you can choose to um mm, 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 got a button there race formation in uh, independent units or brigades corps and armies with much larger numbers uh, if I raise a corps, for example, an armoured corps, it would contain so-and-so many all-rounded tanks and so-and-so many solid tanks. If I raise a light infantry corps, so-and-so many riflemen. You can also further customise these with adding on different weaponry like artillery, machine guns, uh, RPGs, infantry, transports, etc. These can also be further customised and new templates can be unlocked. So to begin with, you've only got uh, motorized infantry and I think mechanized, maybe? 
So light armor cores, that's been researched. Light uh, light armor grenadier core, that's been researched, and so on and so on. You can then create the actual hierarchies of them, the order of battle here, where you can see the various types of units. So I got two infantry formation, the third infantry, and the fourth infantry, with the fourth being a light infantry again. The 5th Mechanized Regiment, the 1st Air Flint with uh, tactical bombers and some recon, and some independent units like blocking companies uh, or SAM launchers, etc. These do add uh, bonuses as the commander of a larger infantry uh, gives his bonus to all of the units underneath him, so attaching units to large formations is very smart. You can also give them stances like this one which is defense or posture, which give bonuses, you can also remove them. So, no bonuses, no malices, because this gives 40 plus defense and minus 30 attack. Now, since he's commanding a machine gun infantry corps, their main job is to be defensive. So they got riflemen, machine guns, and some RPGs to hold off the enemy, whereas the mechanized troops and the tanks are the ones actually going to be doing the attacking. Speaking of attacking, we've got some enemies up here that are in need of a little bit of a beating. So these enemies are getting pretty badly surrounded. Uh, they've changed to a fortress posture to try and defend themselves a little bit better. All right, so we've got artillery here. We're going to move up the artillery, select a ranged attack, and we're going to beat up this grouping right here. A little bit of softening up bombardment. And nothing really happened there. I don't know how many of them there are, as I have imperfect uh, recon on that square. Hmm. I'm pretty sure there's not that many of them up there, so we can probably risk it with a infantry formation sweeping in to clear them out. Operation successful. Yep, in fact there was just that single little uh, brigade up there, so that was easy peasy cleaning them out. I've also got some goddamn clever elephant behind my... God damn supply line. Literally, they're called clever elephants. I've been trying to clear them out of these mountains for dozens of turn out, but the little bastards, well, they're not called clever elephants for nothing. We're going to use the Apaches here to start uh, whittling down these ones as well. So we're going to select air attack. The Apaches are medium attack helicopters with uh, missile pods, so they're pretty good at attacking enemy infantry. You'll see that will also build up the recon, so I'm relatively sure there's not a whole lot of units here. They've also got shit supply, so I should be able to just sweep on in with the infantry and clear them out. No issues. Units can also retreat, and then of course you need to follow them. And we've got one other unit here. Now, these are militia forces. Militia forces do not use the same manpower troops uh, pool as your normal fighters. They are replenished from the militia troop pool. They're also usually kind of garbage, but, um, well, I've got a lot of them here. So I'm feeling relatively confident in my ability to push through and drive this unit up there as well. All right, now we can begin cutting them off more and more and isolating them properly. Meanwhile, over here, this unit, uh, that's quite a lot of stuff. Let's bring in the infantry there. We've got a command unit, okay. I feel pretty confident my tanks can roll over a command unit, so I'm going to send them in there. No, no, they figured they can't quite do that, okay. Well, I've got them hemmed in, and I'm probably going to let them do for a bit. I've got infantry up here to head these guys off. Gonna move in a blocking battalion. So we're gonna transfer the solids, my assault guns, over here to prepare to take down this large formation and move on the city of Tissa. Alright. That was more of a, a side show. We're gonna just... I mean, we're pretty sure there's enemies over there. We're going to keep a watch on that because I want that special building. And we're just going to kind of keep these in check until I'm ready to deal with them. Right. Time for war. Now, I would like to reduce my relationship with this faction more if possible, but I can't. So I could target them as a major power, and I could try to launch a provocation against them. But that's difficulty 125, and... 
My chick is just not that good at intimidation. She hasn't need to really learn yet. Uh, your characters will grow better with time as they've got a skill log. Uh, they are also trying to level up these skills, and they'll try to level them up in a pseudo-intelligent manner. So if they're doing a lot of covert ops, they're going to try and level up covert ops and so on. Uh, speaking of, I would love to send over an embassy to the this guy here. Yep, not a problem. And I wouldn't mind getting one snuck into Dupont Soria here as well. Uh, no, they're not going to take that. We need more relationship first. Um, is there any way we could get that relationship? I wonder. Trade? Nope. Friendship pact? Definitely not. A non-aggression pact? I could give them some money. I do have plenty of money. I kind of don't want a war over there, so let's just give them some cash and we'll try to, you know, keep them placid and deal with them later. 45. Yeah, okay, that's a little bit better. Right, let's get this war on the road. So you'll see a bunch of my leaders aren't super happy with this because we're kind of friends with them. But some of my more aggressive ones, who don't like them at all, well, they're overjoyed. So, here we go. Alright. We've got a hell of a lot more of toys to play around with here. Now, the enemy has a couple of units of anti-air, as you can see here. You can also see the total breakdown of what they've got in the stack. Uh, now, that unit is in an interesting position, but I don't think I can make it all the way around, so I probably can't cut it off, unless the tanks could. Hmm... Now, there could be enemies in this square, as I have imperfect recon. I could send in a recon plane, but it would be attacked by their AA. Uh, quite a lot of AA, too. Don't know if I want to risk that. Mm. Alright, let's 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 try and have a quick peek with the little fireflies. Alright. Okay, they got a pretty good look at things. There's unlikely to be a unit there. They have imperfect information, so there could still be a unit there, though. That's very tempting, because that is a huge... Because they can't get in here, because this is my ally. That would be a huge portion of their stuff gone right there. Let's... Poke forward. We're going to poke with the infantry. No opposition. Okay, the route is clear. Send in the armor. Cut them off. That sim that oh god, that is, that is a that is very nice. I didn't expect a freebie like that. Okay, we're gonna want to reinforce that salient though. Uh, can I I can't get any I can't get any further forces in there. Leaving it with just the armor. Hmm. I might want to turn off Blitzkrieg, because that will that gives me defensive power. And I can't get any more infantry in there. Hmm. Right, well... There's armor. Maybe... Okay, maybe, you know what? I'm just going to shift my focus over. I'm going to move the artillery over there. And I'm going to just beat the shit out of that hex. I'm going to use both my mobile artillery batteries. And I'm going to use my ro rocket launchers. And my heavy missile battery. And I'm just going to pound it. And see if we can't do some serious damage on them. Uh, damage done. Now we've got very good recon right now. They've got some light armor. They've got some infantry. They've got some anti-tank. And they've got AA. They've got quite a lot of light armor. So, if I were to try this... Yeah. I definitely want to soften them up a lot more before I go in there guns blazing, Misa thinks. Right. Let's give them something else to worry about as well, then. So we've got some armor up here. Uh, some tanks. But not that many. Mm, right. I feel relatively confident in my ability to bash my way through here with two mechanized uh, uh, regiments, I think, straight up. And an assault gun independent brigade. Yeah, that's looking pretty damn good. I did take a couple of casualties there, as you can see. But we've made it through. I'm going to use that to zoom right on through, like this. 
isolating this unit, which will then be absolutely just murdered by my mechanized infantry. And as they have nowhere to run, they surrender. Alright. That gives me a pretty damn good front line. In fact, I might want to give this another bash to really screw over any... Ah, oh, no, the tanks are kind of dangerous. Give him one more nice big push. Let's just inflict lots of casualties on him. Oh, yeah, that went very well. Very well indeed. All right. Now, that also pushes them a little bit out of AA range, because this AA only has two range, whereas my Fountains, my Sams, have three range. We're going to move those up to make sure they're in, uh, in range. And we've got some fighters as well, and we've got some tribbles, our lighter helicopters here. But there's quite a lot of them, so let's have them have a go at this unit here, shall we? That will also reveal any anti-air in the area. You can see they're using their, uh, their action points to actually carry out their attacks. So they killed one, and they harassed them a little bit. Pretty nice, pretty nice. I'm quite happy with that. I wouldn't mind some more air power over here, actually, but uh, with the actual Apaches kind of busy right now, we're all going to have to make do with what we've got. Imperfect air superiority is still air superiority. Um, let's move in a militia unit, too, over here, just to kind of guard our northern flank, as it's looking a little bit thin. Not expecting the militia to hold out long against anything, mind you, but they will provide me with at least warning that something is about to descend on me from the north. Alrighty then, uh, with that being done, do I want to change the stance of my armor? I probably do. Let's. Okay. So, we're gonna do that. Uh, we are going to change it from Blitzkrieg. Uh, do we have anything better? Rush? No. Fluid defense, infantry plus artillery. Mechanized forces get 30 on defense, but they're an attack. Nope. Entrenchment and maximum entrenchment, but overall attack 40. Hmm. Entrenchment isn't really going to help me here. Okay. In that case, I am just going to probably clear the uh, thing instead. Let's see. How did we? How did you do that again? Uh, brown group. Nope. I don't even remember now. Oh, no, it's this thing. Uh, yes, there you go. Unit. Uh, remove that posture. We're going to remove Blitzkrieg for now to give ourselves a little bit more defense. I mean, 50 medium armor is hardly the most vulnerable thing in the world, but I'm not convinced this is going to last. Let's see. Even if it doesn't, and they get pushed south, I am confident in my ability to rescue that unit next turn, so I, it's not the end of the world, even if they do get pushed off. And if they don't, that is going to be the end of the world for my enemies, so I am happy with that uh, little trade-off right there. Alright, they're moving in yet further reinforcements here with the Maritime Trade Company, so they still have access to ports up in this place, I would guess. It's annoying. I might have to try and get Blowfish to push up further. Try and screw them over a little bit. Alright, will they try... Yep, they're trying. They did succeed in pushing off that formation right there. I'm actually surprised they went for that one. I'm surprised even more so that they managed to get through, actually. That uh, lost 400 infantry. Ah, that was much better than I'd expected them to do. Ah, damn it. Alright. Well, they still haven't closed that gap, so in that case, I am going to simply move straight on back in it, and I am going to continue to pummeling the shit out of this unit. So they did move out a bunch of units there. They did evacuate most of them. But that also means that whatever is left can probably be overrun quite easily. Uh, we'll throw in support from the infantry. Some casualties are probably unavoidable, but it should be a fairly easy battle. Yes, indeed. That was a nice big chunk of enemy units taken care of there. 
All right, now you can see the black icon here. That means that unit hasn't received any supplies uh, this turn, which means they will have to get a turn to actually get uh, properly effective again, but not the worst thing. Okay, I don't think there was any air attacks. I didn't see any. We're going to go back to the history tab just in case and just seeing. All right, so that was the attack. So they attacked me with yeah, quite a lot of stuff there. I'm still surprised I didn't hold my ground, because I did have a fair bit of defenders there. But they might simply just have gotten quite lucky. I think I can um, I can play the battle too, so let's actually do that. Ah. Damn it, you don't have that thing? Ah. You can't see the battle properly. That's a bit annoying. Okay. Mm, is there anything else I could perhaps nobble up here then? Maybe. Well, I could kind of separate these. Hmm. All right, let's make sure that we've actually got some troops here. So let's make sure we get our replenishments on on the way. Make sure we got all of the RPGs. We're also going to be upgrading parts of the formation whilst we're doing this too. Now, you can't simply do this willy-nilly, however. You do actually need the logistical system to do this. So that is yet another mechanic. Yes, indeed. As you've got a logistical system. Right now, I've got a rail connection from my capital, which is moving a lot of logistical points over here. Those logistical points are then loaded onto trucks, as I've got a truck station here. Uh, da -da -da -da, this one here. And that then begins leading the, uh, unloading the rest further on. Uh, the amount moved also depends on the quality of the road, so dirt roads will be worse than steeled roads, for example. And you can see I've got several thousand points excess here, so I am not particularly worried. You can also upgrade the truck stations too, and you can build truck stations in different areas to also increase your logistical network. But with all of the lo logistics I am pushing in here, I probably don't need one. I've got truck station 3 already. I probably got enough for the foreseeable future. You can also see that uh, some of my resources will have decreased, like 2,000 ammunition, for example, because you will, you whenever you do something, you expend resources to do it, and so you need to replenish those resources, of course. Now, I would really like to continue beating up those flak guns right there, because if I can deal with those then my air power will be far more potent. Actually, let's see if I can start freeing up my air power up here. So that formation is beat to shit, so I should be able to just move in and crush that, and indeed I can, no problems. Let's begin moving the militia back to try and deal with those goddamn clever elephants too, little god bastards. Uh, yep, there's something there, isn't it? Yep, yep. Ah, uh, some kind of, yep, yeah, ocean monsters. Ocean monsters cutting my goddamn supply lines. Yep, yeah, I do. I hate how intelligent they are because they never act like animals. They act like an opposing malicious force. Not like creatures at all, but as something that really wants to hurt you and knows how to do it because it acts in the manner of the game. Okay, we are going to begin the construction of a sealed road up here then. Uh, using a bunch of our production points to get that out of the way as well. I wish they would just act like animals, because these the, they they never stop attacking either. There used to be like 700 of these, but I've murdered most of them, and yet the animals will never stop coming. Which is kind of retarded. Ah, goddammit. Okay, well, I forgot about you. I couldn't see you either. Do I have a unit free to deal with you? Um... I might in a second. So that unit has been isolated for a while and is probably beat to shit. This unit is lacking in ammo. Um, we can probably... I'm going to send in the tanks first because they're unlikely to take a lot of damage even if they can't overrun them. And if they can overrun them, then that would of course be brilliant. Not quite. Okay, okay. Let's send in... We'll punt in two infantry units then. That should be plenty. Good job. Yep, that's those routed, and that will free up infantry to deal with that. 
There we are. Okay. That clears up my rearward lines quite nicely. I'm going to have to move these back. Now, they can kind of slip out there a little bit, which is mildly annoying, but... Oh, well. Uh, that means I can probably spare the Apache 2, so I'll begin strategically relocating them, them down here to New Archia, where they will be able to join the fight next turn. Uh, strategic relocation does use uh, logistic points. You can see that they were re reduced there a little bit, or uh, we used more of them. So you can't simply move your units like that willy-nilly, because if you do, you're going to run out of ammunition, which is unfortunate. Right, I'm going to reinitiate that, uh, 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 that, 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 that thing, that, that thing, that, that thing, the Blitzkrieg thing on the 5th Mechanized Division. To keep them on the offensive here. And we are just going to kind of pummel on in here, I think. All right. So, anti-tank guns. Hmm. Oh, it's just that. Okay. Well, I could send in the infantry then. Uh, and they would have a decent chance of doing some pretty good damage to them. I would really like to surround and kill them. Because that would again give me a superiority. But no chance on that just yet. Hmm. I could wait a turn. Hmm. Mm, yeah. We can at the very least launch a ranged attack with the missile launchers to soften them up a little bit. And we'll set these up for a go next turn. Do I want to deal with the armor or do I want to deal with that nonsense? Deal with that nonsense. Again, using mechanized units are not ideal here because the anti-tank guns will do quite a lot of damage to them. But I will do quite a lot of damage to them, too. I did not manage to rout them, however, which is a little bit unfortunate. Right, let's also replenish some of my units here. Uh, Voltabus 2, Rees, are you... Yes, I think I'm just going to use Voltabus 3s there. You can also... Uh, the, there is a reason why you would want different uh, variants of the same unit. Uh, for the simple reason that some units can actually be specialized. Uh, for example, I have a pattern of truck that uses electricity rather than um, fuel to run. Now that, however, requires the application of a lot more specialized machinery, which means it actually eats the machinery resource, making the unit way, 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 way more expensive. But, of course, the ability to move without using oil, well, energy you can get by you know, pumping energy directly out of the ground, or by utilizing volcanoes on the map, and there's many ways to get it, and it is more or less infinite. Whereas fuel, ooh, fuel will begin to run out as the various resource points on the map, like, uh, let's see if we can find one here, like this one, for example, as you can see here, it has 37,000 fuel, which sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but it ain't infinite. It is far from infinite, and considering I've got 18,000 in the bank right now, and I am using 870 to use, to move my units even just this little bit on the offensive, yeah, you can start running out of that rather quickly. These poor little tanks stand no chance. They don't have enough armor to stand up my, to my laser weaponry, so I'm just going to bully them a little bit straight up. Hmm... Still a bit worried about this area up here. I feel as if I'm about to get something sweeping down behind me. Let's deploy uh, some extra little picket forces in the form of militia members up there, shall we? Just to be safe. And also, we are going to send our little happy dappy spotter planes to have a little bit of a look. Birds are in the sky. See if there is anything at all they can see. Nope. Okay. Lovely. In that case, I might get a little bit more ballsy and grab that thermal plant as well to give me yet more energy, as there are even little uh, objects on the map that give you energy too. Alright, is there anything... No, everything is range of the AA. How very infuriating. Alright. 
There is also one last thing that I'll cover before I'll begin wrapping up, and that is that there are um, these stratagems. There are, of course, a lot of them, uh, depending on zones, like increasing private investment in certain zones, uh, bolstering leaders, crime crackdowns. There are also criminal syndicates in the game uh, looking for resources or deploying faith cards. So this is the thing I want to talk about. Faith cards are certain very powerful effects that can only be used using faith points. Faith points are generated twice in an epoch, so it takes a very long time to build them up, or you can play negative faith cards, which are very damaging, like this one. A random zone will lose 5d10 percentage of population and workers. That could wipe out a truly hilarious quantity of dudes, but it would give you 9 fate points. And these could then be used to get extra political points, uh, credits, um, increases to order, for example, uh, or massive bonuses to combat, or my personal favorite, which I've been saving up for, Ancient Depots. We're going to play that, and that is going to give me access to a bunch of cool-ass archaeotech. Now that stuff is excellent because the cool ass archaeotech gives you all kinds of bullshit special powers you see and when you get them you can put them then on your actual troopers as well an ancient underground complex in dixie hmm well we're not gonna worry about that too much for now now let's see what do we get we get a subterranean sensor uh, subterranean sensor. Ancient asset accompanying handheld sensor will help you make arch archaeological finds. Okay. An automated clinic. Or go on those. Oh, and a cloning facility. Now, this one is okay. It's not the worst. It gives a lot of quality of life score and it keeps people healthy, which is nice. But this one, this is the big one because it gives you a thousand free people every turn. Like the war here, I started it because I want there cloning tech so that is brilliant and will definitely be placed um let's see in beefy uh, beefo holy here we'll place that there and we'll place the automated clinic up there as well i believe and for the subterranean sensor that's going to go over here because that's where all of my unexplored territory is fantastic now i am going to uh quickly have a save him and i'm going to take you back to the main menu to real quickly show you the planet generator so when you start a new game you are given a series of options dup, dup, dup. starting with cla planet class so unclassified is anything it's random which is the best option by the way men play random or seth class a desert planet a cerberus class a lava planet that one's quite fun too a sewer class similar to earth but lots and lots of marshes a moon class a dead planet uh, you've also got the hydra class which is a very heavily populated one usually with a lot of water or a morgana class very very mountainous and arid or the oceania ones which tend to have a lot more oceans or the gaia which is earth class like which means you might even have uh, uh you know being it might be livable jesus christ you might actually be able to go outside without a suit on so let's take random and then you've got history so this you can click off to get certain modifiers so maybe you want to fight one big enemy then you take nemesis uh, maybe you want to have uh, only yourself with uh, nemesis there's only one air major dream so this will be just you doing whatever and you know dealing with the planet or you and one nemesis mm. uh, alien life not all planets are guaranteed to have alien life but you can tick this off and it'll give you a chance to get alien life even on a lava world that probably normally wouldn't have it. Aliens can be really annoying because again, they are more like an opposing malicious military force rather than mere aliens, so yeah. Uh, we don't really bother too much about these, so we can go on. So detailed plan generation, always, that's the best one. Uh, you can turn off things like crime syndicates, corporations, and sects, like religions. You can set starting tech level, whether or not you want air forces, etc., development speed. Um, I find that most of these are good or normal, but if you select alien life forms, do take an army, because the militia 
they they just can't fight the alien creatures. They just get their asses absolutely pounded, meaning that you can easily get yourself completely stuck in your base. Bearing in mind that alien life forms don't need to be things like you know cats and lions, tigers, etc., or even like uh, stuff like on my previous world, giant sea serpents. Oh no, alien life forms can be things like fifteen meters tall, armored flesh-eating ghoul monsters that actively seek out and eat your population whilst being immune to anything but anti-tank weaponry. That is a potential outcome, so, you know, bear that in mind. We then go on to the planetology. So this is plants in an eccentric and extremely slow orbit around a blue-white star. So this might determine stuff like temperature. So it's a blue star, so it's cold as hell. Temperature is 7 degrees Celsius. Solar radiation, uh, not great. Gravity, quite low. Now, low gravity means that um, stuff like propellers can be a bit derpy it depends on the density of the atmosphere actually if the atmosphere is nice and dense then even with low gravity you can still move in fact there are heli there are airplanes that flap their wings yes like birds and those are good builds on uh, planets with low gravity and dense atmospheres, or uh, planets with very high gravity and also dense atmospheres and so on. So on some atmosphere, some planets, uh, propellers will be great, on some jets will be great, on some jets will be useless, on some propellers will be useless. You can also re-roll this, mind you. Let's continue on. Geology. So 7% mountains, 13% plains, 80% oceans. And in this case, oceans, I believe, uh, is lava and boiling water. So, yeah. Uh, let's see if we can get a little bit more. Oh, there you go. That's that's a hell of a lot better. There. Uh, not a whole lot of rainfall, so water is going to be rare. Ocean's rare, so water is also going to be really, really rare. It's going to be cold as hell, so most of the water you're going to get is probably going to be ice. There's going to be very little liquid water. Modus atmosphere. So, atmospheric hazards, insidious, if you any breach in your suit, your ass is grass. Uh, senior biological hazards, none. So, atmosphere farming, toxic, zero value. So, you can't farm here. And any human crops die instantly upon exposure to the atmosphere. Uh, top evolution life forms, nothing. No aliens here. You can rear all this, and you can keep reeling until you get what you want. So, let's, for example... Um, I, I doubt you can get anything but insidious here because of how ridiculously cold. Oh, you, you can get toxic. Uh, there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, toxic is not as bad as insidious. Toxic merely die means that you will die uh, in minutes rather than seconds, which is nice. You know, it's, it's, it's certainly something. Uh, can we get any alien life forms here? No, uh, there's no life that's going to be evolving on our lava planet, I'm afraid. Alright, then the colonization, which gives you a brief timeline of what happened. Uh, this can also determine what kind of people were on the planet. So, it's primarily a service and mining economy, so there's going to be a lot of miners and civilians. 18 million, which is quite yeah, decently. And then we go to the apocalypse, the doomsday. So, 1.3 million survivors... Uh, Decent. I've seen a lot worse. Uh, some nukes have exploded, so they will be nuclear radiation. Uh, mostly farmers and scavengers survived, with some raiders, zero hunters, because, well, there is, there is nothing to hunt. And then you get a little bit of a breakdown here. And that is your planet, where you can uh, do a new planet or re-roll everything. So let's, for shits and giggles, have a quick look at how our planet looks. So, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Blah. So you can select a little bit of your starting stats. We don't care too much about that. And... Da -da. Ah, that's a lot greener than I expected. Now that doesn't look too bad. Yeah, no, this looks actually relatively hospitable. Look, this is... Oh, no, we picked random, didn't we? Oh, this is not bad. Yeah, look at this. This is quite lovely. Okay, so there are still going to be some hazards. In this case, I'm betting uh, free folk, I would assume, are up there. Uh, yeah, this, this is lovely. Look at this. Yep, free folks, which you gotta deal with. They don't like you, and you're gonna have to shoot them. Yeah, 
this is a lovely place. Like, I've even got near the ocean. This is this is great. Like, this is a very hospital. I even start with a little metal mine next to me. This is fantastic. Yeah, this is... It's no problem. You're gonna have to grow all of your food indoors, and if your suit ever breaches, well, you're dead, but... That's pretty good. It's pretty good. Anyways. I'll wrap it up there. Shadow Empire. So, this is a really cool game that I do heavily recommend if you're willing to put in the time to learn it. Let me throw in that little caveat there, because this is a very complex game, and it does a bad job of communicating a lot of the complexity. You are going to have to go through tab upon tab upon tab upon tab upon tab to figure out a lot of the information the game is telling you. You are often even going to have to call your goddamn advisors and ask them to report to you to give you the information you need. The game has a, a very old UI, it has a lot of UI elements, like, the, the, the UI, the, again, look at this, like, each element has different UI element, element, it's like, the sidebars have tabs, the tabs have tabs, <laughs> and it has not a lot of tooltips, like, it's got some which gives you a basic idea, but if I, for example, wanted to click on this and be like, okay, uh, who are you, like, what does this mean? What specifically does this affect? Uh, what does this mean? Like, he has history. Does he level up? When does he level up? How much experience does he need? What is he going to focus on leveling up, etc, etc. It does have a fairly large uh, manual, but it is sadly now a bit outdated, too, with the release of the Oceania DLC, so... Uh. The first few times you boot up the game, you're probably gonna die almost instantly. And painfully, especially if you start with Militia, as everything in the world will kick your goddamn ass. So, it is gonna require a long learning experience, but if you actually manage to get around to figuring out the game and getting into it, it is very fun and very rewarding. Just be prepared to have your butt violated once or twice. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching. And I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day. Free of butt violations. Hopefully.